All right, a very warm welcome to our Merix webinar. I'm Valerie Tan, analyst at the Chinese Politics and Society team at Merix here in Berlin. In today's webinar, we're talking about leadership succession in the Chinese Communist Party, who or what comes after Xi Jinping when he steps down from power, either willingly or otherwise. To some extent, today we're also hypothesizing China's future and doing an assessment about the resilience of the communist regime. That's also the subject of a recent report by two of our speakers today, and an upcoming report by Merix, both of which you will hear more about in just a minute. Before we begin, a very important message for everyone. This webinar will be recorded, a link to this will be uploaded and made available online on our Merix website. If you'd like more information about our data privacy protection policy, please feel free to head over to our Merix website for further details. We have also reserved time for you to ask questions in the webinar that's coming up in the second half of the program, and I will provide instructions for you to do so later. Let me introduce the speakers. Joining us here in Berlin, Katja Drinhausen, Senior Analyst at Merix, specialist on China's legal and governance system, specifically on China's digital governance and social credit system. Jude Blanchett joins us from Washington. Jude is Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Previously, he was Engagement Director at the Conference Board's China Center for Economics and Business in Beijing. And in Sydney, Richard McGregor, Senior Fellow for North Asia at the Lowy Institute. Richard is the former Beijing and Washington Bureau Chief for the Financial Times and is the author of two books about the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. Jude and Richard are co-authors of the report after Xi, Future Scenarios for Leadership Succession in Post-Xi Jinping Era. Richard will start by giving us a historical overview of the procedures for leadership in the CCP and why transition of power in China is important, not just to China watchers like us, but to key decision makers around the world. Over to you, Richard. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got to unmute. Hi, right, let's start again. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Merix. I'm very honored to be appearing on an event with Merix after the uh, recent sanctions and the like, and thank you, Jude. I just wanted to start with some context, which I thought would, you know, it might be obvious to everybody, but first of all, um, you know, if, if we think back to the, uh, the Cold War, I'm old enough to remember it, and the contest between the US and the Soviet Union, the Soviet economy never came anywhere near the US economy, except it was, but in any case, it was still able to challenge the US. Let's have a look at the second slide then, uh, with the comparing the US economy to the Chinese economy. Is that coming up? Here we go now. Uh, this is something which is pre-COVID, but in fact might have been accelerated post-COVID. Uh, China is clearly going to be, in an aggregate sense, a challenger to the US economy and in likelihood will surpass it. Um, uh, on top of that is China's power in terms of trade. If we can have the third slide now. The, in this slide, if you look at the blue countries, the countries in blue, starting in 1960 or so, had the US as their largest trading partner. Over time, uh, the countries in red have China as their largest trading partner. And as you can see from this graph, uh, a, a graphic China just takes over. So that's, that's power. Now that might be, um, uh, give us some idea why we get this great confidence in China these days. There's the famous slogan in China, which is uh, many of you will have heard is quite popular. The East is rising, the West is declining. And by the way, when they say the East, they don't mean Asia, they mean China. And when they say the West, they usually mean the United States for the most part. I think it's important to remember that this confidence has been growing for well over a decade. Starting in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, China recovers much more quickly than the United States. That marks the moment when China loses faith in the US financial model. The US economy recovers a bit, Chinese confidence comes back. 
The next moment of confidence, confidence, I think, was 2016, the election of Donald Trump. This time, China looks at the US political model with askance. China believes its model is meritocratic, and they say to the US, look who you've elected. Uh, once again, that confidence come back, comes back when China, Trump destabilizes China a bit. Uh, and then we come to this very moment we're in now, COVID, which is, of course, the greatest moment, I think, of Chinese confidence of all. You might remember only a year ago, we were talking about China's Chernobyl. Uh, obviously, China doesn't want to talk about the initial outbreak. They want to talk about how China got that under control, and they want to compare that to the US, the UK, and Europe. Now, in every one of these cases, in the financial crisis, uh, in the election of Trump and the response to the virus, China says, our system worked, yours didn't, or at least our system worked better than your system. Uh, the competition with the US and the West generally, I think, is multi-spectrum. Spectrum. It's about trade, economics, uh, the region, military, geopolitical, technology, but in many respects, most of all, it's ideological, or to put it in a different fashion, it's a contest between systems. And that's certainly how it's played out internally in China. Now that brings me to Xi Jinping uh, and his leadership. Um, now, unlike any previous leader, and that certainly applies to Mao Zedong, he has no identifiable rival. They've all been sidelined or locked up. Uh, it's very important to remember that. Um, the, uh, I'm just skipping a little bit here. Um, I think it's often overlooked in the, in, in, you know, certainly Xi is a very powerful leader. It's often overlooked from the outside. He has many enemies and critics. Uh, I call them good enemies and bad enemies. The good enemies, are economic liberals, entrepreneurs, legal and media reformers, scholars, all have suffered under Xi and are very angry about his policy direction. The bad enemies are all those who've suffered at the hands of his anti-corruption campaign. But there's one issue that unites all of Xi's critics, and that is the way that he has dumped uh, what had become the centerpiece of Chinese political reform, and that was the two-term system or the two-term limit, both for the presidency and for the position, most importantly, of party secretary. So that means as it stands now in uh, China, uh, we have no idea how long she will stay in power for. And I think very few people uh, in China uh, also have any idea how long he'll stay in power for. Now, all political systems have issues with succession. Uh, you've had an elongated debate in Germany. And of course, we saw what happened uh, in the US with President Trump. In China, uh, or I wouldn't say uniquely, but distinctively amongst authoritarian systems, they thought they had solved this problem. Uh, and the solution to the problem went back to the early 1980s when Deng Xiaoping set out to obviously uh, launch economic reforms, but I think less well understood outside of China is that he also launched significant political reforms. Uh, people outside of China often say the CCP is not engaged in political reform, but that's only true from an outsider's perspective. From their perspective, uh, they've made many political reforms, and from their perspective, they've been very successful. Uh, the most important one of those uh, was the rule brought in by Deng to make a limit, a two-term limit for the presidency in the early 80s, and that was directly aimed at preventing a repetition of uh, Mao Zedong's rule, where you had a dictator for life, and in the case of Mao, of course, quite a vindictive dictator uh, at that. <clears throat> this was the centerpiece of a whole series of reforms which were meant to sort of limit uh, uh, the power of senior officials in provinces, in cities, in ministries, in the Central Committee, in the Politburo and the like. You have all sorts of retirement rules uh, and so forth. The most important one was for the presidency, which eventually turned into a term limit also for that of party secretary. Uh, but of course, that has now been dumped um, by Xi. Now, you'll find some people in China who'll tell you that the fact that the term limit for presidents, uh, uh, the two term, five year term limit for the presidency was only dumped uh, to bring it into line for the position of party secretary, which has no term limit uh, at all. 
But if you go back and look as Jude and I did at the Chinese scholarship uh, about this issue uh, before she dumped the rule in 2018, you'll see that very senior people in China all applauded uh, what Deng had done uh, and how this rule had worked. Um, uh, the biggest beneficiary of the rule, it should be said, was Xi Jinping himself. There has only been one clean transfer of power uh, uh, since 1949 in the PRC. Uh, in other words, a clean transfer of power from party secretary, from the presidency, from the chair of the military com uh, commission, in other words, head of the military, and that was to Xi Jinping himself. Uh, he has now thrown that out. Uh, even though he was the biggest beneficiary of this rule uh, of all. Now, I won't go into all the technical details. Uh, and the question we asked in our paper, it, what might happen next? Um, and on that note, I'll hand back to Valerie and Jude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, it just sounds like rules are meant to be broken when it comes to Chinese leaders. <laughs> Uh, Jude will now speak about the four likely scenarios that uh, you've put together for us. Over to you, Jude. Great. Well, thank you yeah, very much, Val. And, and uh, I also want to echo Richard's sentiment on just what an honor it is to be uh, joining an event organized by, uh, by Merricks. Um, and want to thank Richard for really a great partnership, something that we more than a year ago, I remember being on a phone call, you were somewhere and I was somewhere and we were, we were spitballing this and it's great to see this finally come to, to fruition. So to be economical with time here, um, I'm gonna just uh, spend a few minutes on each of the four scenarios, but I wanted to make just a few points at the outset, which is uh, it was really hard to uh, um, think of the only scenarios that were possible. And so what Richard and I tried to do is, is punt, as we say in American football terms, by uh, defining four possible scenarios with the really important proviso that there are multiple other scenarios that would be possible. And, and indeed, some may even be more likely as time goes on. The uh, purpose of this paper was not to predict the future, but rather to start a discussion because I think there's a great deal of anxiety now in China and around the world about what is gonna happen in the future in China. Um, what is gonna happen at the 20th Party Congress? And more importantly, how long does Xi Jinping intend to stay on the throne? And so what we wanted to do in this, in this report was um, begin provoking some discussion on possible trajectories that China might follow, how we might assess those as external observers and how we might begin to quantify and qualify what the implications of a given trajectory would be for China, uh, for China's political stability, for China's economic stability, and by uh, extension for, for the rest of the world, given how central China is. And as that graph Richard just showed about China's economic rise and integration into the world, um, previous eras where you had leadership instability, let's say after the death of Mao, or, or even in the mid 1980s, the reverberations outside of China were relatively muted given how economically and politically isolated China was in comparison to today. Um, so we're obviously talking about something vastly more significant um, if this were occur to occur now. So if I could ask to, to go to the next slide, please. Um, so scenario one is um, maybe the most unlikely, but we want to be fair here and say that the next moment where there could be a leadership transition would be as per expected at, in 2022 at the 20th Party Congress. Um, again, why we put this scenario is less that we think this is going to happen and more because of the dynamics which may shape Xi's decision making um, would be apposite even if he didn't step down. And, and that is um, Xi Jinping talks to uh, a, an important extent about modernization of China's governance system. And indeed, as we quote in the report, he has even talked about um, uh, transition of power as being a component of leadership uh, succession, or excuse me, uh, leadership succession of being a, a component of, of governance modernization. It, it strikes me, and this is a little bit of subjective judgment here, it strikes me that Xi Jinping understands at a theoretical level that the lifetime tenure, um, which predominated obviously under the Mao era, 
would, would have a really deleterious effect on uh, the governance system of China. So there's, there's one scenario here or, or several, a group of scenarios where he is in fact intending to step down. It's just a question of when does he feel like he has groomed the right successor, has essentially stabilized his agenda and put it on more firm footing and feels comfortable uh, stepping into the shadows. Um, that's unlikely to be a, next year, uh, but nonetheless, we wanted to at least put it out there. But more importantly is the second reason that we teased out here, which is um, it is important for uh, authoritarian leaders to recognize the more that they erode some of these power sharing norms, the more they raise a risk to themselves, um, which is the reason China had uh, nominal term limits or, or de facto term limits was as a sort of power sharing agreement that, that came into being. It meant that because uh, a, a, a leader of a rival faction or indeed someone lower down the hierarchy understood that there was gonna be a power transition at some point in the near future, um, it meant that they were a little bit less anxious about speeding up that person's exit. Now that Xi Jinping has essentially declared uh, the, my timeline is indeterminate. Um, one can imagine that rivals uh, are beginning to think about how can we speed up Xi Jinping's exit um, in non-constitutional means. And so a reason someone might retire early is precisely because they recognize danger to them rises if they essentially announce, if they blow through the 20th Party Congress still in power with no successor, um, there, there may well be some, some challenge to them. Um, so that, that is a scenario one, uh, unlikely, but possible. So if we could go to slide two. So uh, what is a split the difference type of scenario? That is, uh, uh, Xi Jinping may likely say, look, I have a pretty significant um, and ambitious policy agenda, um, but um, I, I cannot get this done by 2022. Um, one of the reasons I have not announced a successor is because as soon as one does, we all understand the concept of a lame duck. As soon as you announce a successor uh, on, a, on some sort of timeline, um, then you see that, um, I see there's a lot of chatter about the slides. Um, I, the slides are essentially, I'm just talking to the slides. So um, if, if folks just wanna focus on my words here, that'll probably suffice rather than just reading the slides. So uh, the scenarios are, you know, Xi Jinping could potentially retire in 2027 or 2032, um, and that would be at the 21st and 22nd Party Congress. The rationale here is my agenda won't be complete by 2022, but I recognize the importance of stepping down. So essentially, you know, given the external volatility right now, given the momentous domestic agenda, I need more time. So what could occur, which I think is certainly possible, is at the 20th Party Congress, um, we see that Xi Jinping does announce some form of successor, um, but instead of that person taking over the 20th Party Congress, they begin being groomed for later, uh, for later accession to power. Just two small caveats here. Number one, that's happened before. And one of the most dangerous places to be in an authoritarian system is the, is the leader in waiting. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, that ends up with you uh, finding your way to the exit before you get to power. Um, but I think nonetheless, it's important to, to, to think of this as a plausible scenario or even a possible scenario. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide um, is thinking about something on, very much on the minds of, of, of uh, observers over the past few years. Uh, which is now that Xi Jinping has essentially announced that term limits don't, don't apply even for the party secretary, does that speed up or does that create the conditions for a leadership challenge or, or, a, lead, or a coup? Um, obviously, research on authoritarian political systems shows that um, leaders uh, often are, are moved to the exits by way of a, a challenge from a uh, political elite. Certainly, if you hear some of the rhetoric coming from Xi Jinping and some of his lieutenants, they talk about uh, coup plots within the party. Xi Jinping has warned about these. We quote in the report other senior officials, including Wang, Qi, Wang Qishan, who talk about this. This indeed is, is, a, is a key feature of China or the Communist Party's uh, political system over 100 years. Um, 
leadership plots, uh, coups, overthrowing successors, over attempting to overthrow leaders. None of this is particularly new. And, and uh, for authoritarian systems, this may well be the norm. So indeed, looking at a hundred year history, um, it, it may not, the puzzle we may need to be answering is not, um, why is leadership succession breaking down under Xi? Maybe the, the puzzle we need to answer is how was it for about 10 years, there was regularized leadership succession, uh, given that over that hundred year history of uh, volatility may well be the norm. Um, I think I can't, you know, I think Richard and I came to something of a meeting of the minds here as we thought through the possibility of a leadership challenger coup. Um, I just came to the realization that the logistical components of organizing a leadership coup are, are pretty significant. I think many folks now are probably reading Richard Garside's new book, The China Coup. Um, um, I, I think it's an interesting book to read through, but what, one of the things that struck me in reading the first chapter where he lays out the leadership, uh, the formal leadership challenge that is brought to Xi Jinping by, by Wang Qishan and, and Li Keqiang uh, and Wang Yang is just how seamless it goes. And I would imagine um, right now, given the level of, of oversight and surveillance that Xi Jinping has, given that members of the Politburo and Standing Committee are not allowed to be meeting on their own, um, given that members of the, the Politburo and Standing Committee, except for Xi Jinping, do not have relationships with, with the Chinese military for, for, from Xi Jinping's perspective for very good reasons. Um, I would be uh, more convinced of a possible coup or leadership challenge scenario if I, if I saw the math and could understand how the logistics would be pulled together. Um, but it seems, given the level of, of control and authority and oversight and surveillance Xi Jinping has, um, it, it, just the initial steps of fomenting um, that sort of plot seem pretty extraordinary. Not implausible, uh, but certainly extraordinary or significant. And so um, this is one where I think most of our external analysis is kind of thinking, when will Xi Jinping push the system so far that, that, that a coup takes place? Um, but looked at another way, Xi Jinping has spent the first two terms in power coup proofing, um, both in terms of, of rela relationship with the military, with the security system, uh, the breakdown of or the eradication of, of factions, um, ensuring that no uh, senior leaders have um, significant policy uh, silos that are outside of Xi Jinping's purview. He really is at the center of the panopticon. And I think that raises the bar. So uh, final scenario, please, uh, final slide. Um, uh, two certainties, Ben Franklin said, death and taxes. Uh, we know Xi Jinping will die. I don't think it's, I hope it's not controversial to say that. Uh, but for our scenario, we're not thinking about his death or as they say in communist systems, going to see Marx. What we're thinking about here is unexpected death or incapacitation. Why that scenario? And again, remembering that the point of this report is to think about uh, sort of uh, vehicles for, for assessing the governance stability and leadership stability of China. Um, Xi Jinping is, is 67, um, no offense to him, but he's, he's a little bit overweight. He has a high stress job. As far as I can tell, he doesn't have robust exercise uh, regimen and he once was, he says he quit, but he once was a smoker. There is a non-zero probability that he has some sort of health event, um, you know, over the next five or 10 years. And I think our big question is, how would the system respond? I put a, I, uh, for those, uh, I'm not sure if the slides are fixed, it doesn't matter. But for those uh, who can't see the slides, I, I put a picture of Stalin um, and his death in, of course, in 1953 after a sudden stroke. And, and anyone who has not seen the movie Death of Stalin it is a comedy, but it gets to some core truths about the shroud of uh, the, the, the shroud of, of um, uncertainty which envelops a system. Once you have a very predominant central leader suddenly exit, it opens up all sorts of new fissures and fault lines that that appeared to be non-existent when the leader was still there. Um, on paper, the, the leadership succession procedure is quite straightforward. But as we well know, and as Richard mentioned at the top of his remarks, leadership succession is very, very hard, even in very constitutionalized um, and institutionalized systems. The anecdote I always think of is in 1981, when Ronald Reagan was shot, um, Alexander Haig, the then Secretary of State, stood up in front of the media and said, I am in charge. But he wasn't. 
the vice president was constitutionally in charge, but in charge. But what that anecdote shows us is, again, even in even in systems that have very uh, regularized procedures for leadership succession, when it happens in a snap, uh, uncertainty can predominate. Um, I'm seeing the time here and I'm realizing I'm, I'm way over my 10 minutes. So I think I'll just I'll, I'll leave it there, but look forward to uh, discussion, um, uh, criticisms uh, and, and uh, otherwise in, uh, in the Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jude. Um, interesting four scenarios that you've painted for us, both you and Richard have painted for us. Let's um, bring in Katia to discuss uh, this aspect of party state integration under C, which Jude and Richard's report alluded to, because we talked about this scenario of a sudden departure of Xi Jinping. Uh, and this is a question I would like to put to Katia. Just how robust are the procedures and institutions in China, and of course the resilience of the CCP in maintaining status quo, should Xi Jinping make a sudden departure? Thanks, Valerie, um, for that great question. And um, even more to you, uh, Jude and Richard, to be here as our guests today. Um, I don't want to take too much time um, and focus from your paper and give the audience time to ask questions, but I uh, would like to say a few words about how your paper connects to different topics and issues we're working on at Merix, because um, personally, and I know um, the same is true for colleagues, I just found it really inspiring to read, um, because as, as Richard mentioned, it goes against um, the current narrative of China's rise, and also the messaging um, about, about coming out of Beijing. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the theme in, in party media and um, official discussions of chaos in the West order in China, um, China as a superior governance model, um, as a stable governance model, for which you create quite the opposite scenario. And um, this opposite scenario, or kind of thinking outside the, the daily box of, of Chinese politics as they are today, um, I found really helpful um, in terms of looking at recent developments in China from different angles, um, specifically uh, in light of, of um, an upcoming Merrick study that will be published in the next weeks, where we look at self-confidence um, in the Chinese governance model um, and, and this notion in Beijing of its systemic advantage and the sources of strength it has um, versus a series of, of fault lines and volatilities um, we define. So I would briefly um, like to ponder these in light of uh, the different scenarios that you outlined. Um, I mean, in terms of um, she, uh, in either of the scenarios, in terms of um, a China after she, the question is, what will remain even after she is gone, right? Um, so in terms of sources of governance stability, um, yes, there might be some struggle at the center, but you do have the system of control over the economy that has been built up over the previous years. Um, something that you also mentioned, the control over the digital sphere through content control, through censorship, um, through quite a tight uh, regulatory environment and uh, an extensive disciplinatory um, system that has been built and really codified and institutionalized party um, disciplinary procedures, also when it comes to maintaining uh, a united ideology and um, keeping dissent in check, um, let alone uh, military modernization that has taken part in the recent years. But despite these sources of, of confidence of the current leadership and the Xi, um, there are quite clear sources of weakness as well that might, in, in such a volatile situation that you um, describe, come to the fore um, while you do have effective centralized control at the moment, it comes at the cost of efficiency, um, both in the economic sector, but also throughout the, the governance system um, to some extent or the other. And, and these um, top, like the, the, the downsides of top down management and um, potential inertia at the lower levels might just greatly amplify in uncertain um, situations and where decision making powers at the centralized core are um, unclear, especially in the situation of outright struggles, uh, which would have great impact on, on both um, the economic development, but also international relations. So um, this paper really also helped to trigger thought about the potential ripple effects 
of these um, weaknesses and fault lines being um, activated, so to say. Um, also, another thing that really um, I found interesting because I do work a lot on um, internet governance, on, on public opinion monitoring and control on discourse control is the question if internal criticism and even um, in a scenario that you didn't raise, uh, which is public discontent or protests um, by the masses of, of, of the people, um, if, if there might even be a situation where just the current system of keeping public opinion control and under check uh, might falter due to um, a power vacuum at the top. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the next leader would inherit a very different situation or institutional environment than he did when he took power, because no matter but what way he will go out, he will leave behind a new toolbox um, for authoritarian rule. And here I'm also thinking about the political and institutional legacy of what we will leave behind, uh, which is um, a strongly bureaucratized and codified party rule that is quite different um, to the revolutionary party and only partially formalized um, communist party um, of the past. Um, and, and maybe um, as, as a question um, also to you, I'm wondering um, to what extent do you think that institutions and processes established under Xi, especially when it comes to um, the tools for purging Descent, but also um, but also corruption might come back to bite C um, or even or especially his former allies um, if she should step down or um, pass away. Um, so maybe I'll I'll end with a short question to you, Jude and Richard, before we hand over um, to Valerie and, and the audience. Um, how different do you think, um, or how similar might a post C China look? Richard, you want to take first first crack? I'll, okay, I'll. I'll um, I, I guess the answer to that, and thank you very much for those uh, comments. Very interesting. Um, I guess the answer to that, if I've understood the question correctly, is it really depends on how the succession takes place. Uh, I guess one of the things that Jude and I are positing is the really the reality that you know Xi Jinping's sort of the calcification of this process means that. He may be setting up the country for a succession crisis. A succession crisis means a very public split at the top of the party, which is the nightmare scenario. Uh, and you can see how past public splits at the top of the party in 1989, and then with 2012 with Bo Xilai, uh, that it deeply scars the system and the system has a kind of volcanic reaction against that, which is even tighter control. Um, we have had cycles in the past of tightening and loosening. Under Xi, we only have tightening. So what is his legacy in that respect? Um, and what are the pressures on the system? First, in terms of succession, uh, you know, if Xi does stay until 2035, which is entirely possible, uh, that means he'll be as old as Joe Biden, by the way, at the end of his first term. I'm crediting Jude and I for making that point. I see lots of people have been stealing it already. Um, but if he stays for that long, that means the next leader of China, if you follow all the other age limit and retirement rules, is someone who's between 50 and 55 today. Um, and of course, we would have no clue who that person might be who would climb through the ranks. So you really are skipping an entire generation of potential leadership aspirants. And that itself places enormous uh, pressure on the system. Uh, and I think if anybody does come to power in a crisis, that person would want to make use of exactly the same tools that she has made use of. And as you say, formalized and bureaucratized the party rules. That is the use of the anti-corruption uh, mechanism which is a very powerful instrument in the hands of a powerful party secretary. And of course, the uh, use of the propaganda system as well. So in other words, the uh, legacy of Xi, the longer it goes on, uh, would seem to me to be a, a much more um, a, a, a attempt at a much more tightly controlled party. Now, I'm not going to sit here and I'm certainly not saying that the whole show is, you know, hurtling towards some sort of collapse. I'm not of that uh, mind. 
Uh, you know, somebody used the word brittle the other day in a meeting I was at, and somebody yelled out from the back of the room that they'd, they'd heard the same word 10 years beforehand. Uh, you know, the system has been resilient, but I think she is stretching it, if not to breaking point, to at least a breaking point. I, I'm not going to add anything because Richard made the point that I was, I think, you know, Katja, that in, embedded in your question, which I think is a really good one, is any executive in any political system who comes to power inherits the, the toolkit that their predecessor either inherited or, or created and expanded. And so if we were thinking about this in a different political context, um, you know, it's as if a, a, a US president comes to power where their predecessor, you know, pioneered new tools like executive actions. And so it would make sense that the incoming leader uh, would, would also inherit and, and excuse me, would also exploit and, and utilize those tools. The only mi minor addition I would say is, you know, I think the, the good literature that's out there that looks at transitions of power in authoritarian systems or, or Erica Franz's work that looks at, you know, what happens when dictator dies shows that whoever assumes power after them is usually uh, this, the same level of, of autocratic, if not more. So our, our, our typical hope, which is you see the death of a dictator as a moment for a pretty fundamental pr political trajectory shift towards a more normalized liberal direction is typically not what happens. Um, and so I think we would need to expect that um, the system right now operating in Beijing, although Xi Jinping has been an extraordinarily important catalyst, um, the sister go, system goes deeper than Xi Jinping. And so whoever the system produces out of a power vacuum uh, of his sudden absence, death or overthrow would likely uh, be of a similar, uh, sim would have similar answers to many of the key governance questions that, that, that China's system is asking right now. Right, thank you all for a very interesting uh, webinar. And I think that's a great way to end today's webinar. Uh, thank you all. Once again, you can read Richard and Jude's joint report on both the CSIS and the Lowy Institute website. And if you're interested in more webinars like this, subscribe to our mailing list and our Merrick's newsletter. I'm Valerie Tan and I wish you a very good day. Thank you very much.